we have four fantastic talks to go. And the first is going to be a Data Blitz presentation from Dr. Robin Nusslock. Great. So um, contrasts always uh, make, I think Eric said, make the mind engage. So my, con my talk will be a bit of a contrast to the wonderful points that were just made um, and focusing on neuroscience. But uh, I'd like to thank Mitch and Eric for organizing this wonderful meeting. Um, it's really a privilege to be here. And uh, I'm going to do more of a contextual blitz rather than data blitz because this rep represents some current kind of thinking that we're doing um, in terms of future grant submissions and current grant submissions. And this is based on the idea that the majority of research um, on depression and mood disorders at the biological level has really taken a single organ perspective and focused exclusively on the brain, which makes obviously a lot of sense. However, I would suggest that a multi-organ perspective might help refine our understanding of risk for uh, psychiatric conditions and may also generate novel treatments. And the foundation for this um, argument was a review paper that my colleague Greg Miller and I wrote recently in which we argue that dysregulation uh, in signaling between the brain and the immune system generates risk for both emotional and physical health problems. And I'd like to today provide you with a very brief overview of this thinking as it pertains to risk for depression. The question that really drove this paper is how does early life adversity, speaking of the environment, get underneath the skin to generate risk for both mental and physical health problems? And relevant to this topic is growing evidence that early life adversity sensitizes cells in the amygdala to be hyper-responsive to threatening stimuli in the environment. And this hypersensitivity persists into adulthood. And we know that hyper-amygdala activation or increased amygdala activation is a risk factor for heightened threat processing, depression, mood disorders, et cetera. In apparel literature, however, it's also been shown that individuals, at elevated, individuals who have elevated early adversity also uh, display increased inflammation. And what happens is that early adversity primes the immune cells that initiate and propagate inflammation. And individuals at who have early adversity display elevated inflammatory biomarkers that persist into adulthood. Now, inflammation is highly adaptive when regulated. It fights off infections. It facilitates the removal of pathogens. But when dysregulated, elevated inflammation can lead to chronic mental and physical health problems, and it's also been associated with increased risk of depression. Now, the mechanisms by which early adversity mediates increased inflammation operates through, in part, the amygdala because under conditions of stress, the amygdala will activate sympathetic nervous system fibers and HPA axis mechanisms via the hypothalamus and initiate the release of hormonal products onto developing white blood cells in the periphery of the body. And that generates a pro-inflammatory phenotype in the body. Um, and so this makes a lot of sense because if the brain is in a state of defense, the body wants to be in a state of defense as well. Now, what's interesting is, is that network traffic between the brain and body flows in the other direction, between the body and the brain. And this has been a more recent understanding in, in biology. Peripheral molecules, pro-inflammatory cytokines, classical monocytes, et cetera, are able to access the brain through a number of mechanisms. But what's interesting is, is that the areas that they access in the brain are the areas that we care about as students and researchers of mood disorders. In particular, inflammation has been shown to access the amygdala and increased threat processing in the amygdala. And there's been studies that if you induce an endotoxin in the periphery and increased inflammation, that will increase the amygdala responsivity in the brain. And that makes sense because if the body's in a state of defense, the brain wants to be in a state of defense as well. Another target of inflammation um, involves uh, circuits in the brain that are involved in reward processing in the basal ganglia and particularly the ventral striatum. Probably the primary target of inflammation in the body is dopamine signaling in the ventral striatum, and it attenuates dopamine signaling and induces a set of sickness behaviors, dysphoria, anhedonia, psychomotor slowing, that are designed to conserve metabolic resources and help you fight an infection or heal from the wound. Now, that is all highly adaptive in the short term. But when chronic, this can lead to chronic reductions in reward-related brain function. And we know chronic reductions in, well, in reward-related brain function are a neural signature of depression. Finally, there's been evidence that increased inflammation also can mo modulate the prefrontal regulatory systems through these microglial cells that are involved in synaptic pruning in the prefrontal cortex. Um, and we and others have shown that heightened peripheral inflammation is associated with reduced network connectivity in the prefrontal cortex, 
um, and reduced executive control over life stressors in the environment. Oops, that's an animation error. So the final point I want to make on this slide is the following, that this essentially suggests that inflammation creates a neural phenotype that we typically see in depression, high threat, low reward, low prefrontal regulatory strength. That often will be associated with a state of dysphoria, negative emotion. People will then engage in self-medicating behaviors to regulate that dysphoria. What do you do when you're in a bad mood? You go out and drink, you eat bad foods, you engage in drug use, not you, but that's what people might do. Um, those are all pro-inflammatory. They increase inflammation in the body. So now the way in which you're regulating your brain is actually increasing inflammation, and that can generate a positive feedback loop by elevated inflammation in the body, driving neural phenotype in the brain associated with depression, which engages further inflammation enhancing behaviors, and et cetera. So we suggest that a neuroimmune dysregulation might reflect a two-hit vulnerability for, in this case, depression, but there's, we're also suggesting in the risk of cardiometabolic illness and um, atherosclerosis and other types of things. Um, and that com the combination of dysregulated brain plus dysregulated immune system may reflect a two-hit vulnerability that also may lead to novel neuroimmune interventions. So for example, a colleague of mine, Michael Treadway, has a grant in which he's using infliximab, which is a potent anti-inflammatory mechanism to reduce inflammation in the periphery as a way of treating depression. And this is for people who have high inflammation, but it might be a road into treating depression who have more of a bottom-up mechanism of depression rather than a top-down mechanism. And this just suggests that you could target these mechanisms through brain or immune system. And there's a lot of research for the individual pathways within this model, but my colleague Lauren Alloy, Greg Miller, and I are submitting a number of grants to kind of do more comprehensive longitudinal tests of these predictions. And so that's my conceptual blitz, and I thank you for your time.